Hey guys, sorry it's been three weeks since a video, but let's get one out right now. I haven't done a lot with Scrappy, sorry to let you down. I have been traveling for a month, it happens with work. I've been on the road in hotels, and uh, other than drafting at night on paper for things to bring back to Scrappy, I've only got a little bit more done since the last video, but I do have more done. We're gonna dive into that. We're gonna catch up on some things I skipped over prior to the last video, and also at the end, there are a lot of great questions that came about the big rocket launch test we did on Scrappy, which was so much fun. If you haven't seen that video, go back and check it out. Blew the top off this plane. But we have some Q&A on that, so let's build some carbon fiber, do some clear coat, make a belly bomb bay door drop, and uh, show you how that works. You guys know the drill. Let's get back to work. It's physics, math, and engineering. Machine it, draft it, build it, test it, break it. Every time something new gets built, the entire world advances. Laying in bed at night, it's designing new parts, designing new suspension, designing new wings. I'm such a dirtbag, I'm not even helping my wife put her plane away. <laughs> This is just what you're supposed to do after you work on Scrappy all day. Have your wife take you for a flight in her carbon cup. Life doesn't get much better. Hey guys, <laughs> we have some extra exciting news today, which is mind blowing. I'm my... expecting. <laughs> she, oh, I flirted. She, <laughs> she it's okay. Wives can interrupt all they want. So she went and got an ultrasound. I already know what it is, but let us show you what we got. We're having a carbon cub. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so my wife loves her carbon cub. I do. But now. I want more. She wants to build her own carbon cub. I do. And, and do one or two little tweaks to it. So Chandra's been watching me build planes for years. She wants to join the party. So we got her a carbon cub in a box over there. And we actually are gonna keep this carbon cub almost strictly all straight carbon cub because we love the carbon cub. She loves the carbon I cub. I love my carbon cub. And so she just wants to do her colors, her interior. Well, and my modifications. Couple little mods, we'll, we'll bump a little horsepower into it and a few things, but all in all, it's gonna be a Carbon Cup EX3 kit. She is promising me that she's gonna build it. I'm gonna build it. With <laughs> maybe a couple of our, our uh, children. So we're gonna try and get try our- and get some free labor. <laughs> we'll try and get, we're gonna try and break that child labor law business, and we're gonna put our little kids to work. So anyway, we're super excited to share the news with you. Chandra is gonna start building a plane, so follow us along on the journey. We're done with kids. <laughs> <laughs> Parts aren't needed anymore. We, <laughs> our, our youngest is now 18, coming up on 19. So our kids is now our airplanes and all our animals. So we have, we have three, three dogs, three cats. <laughs> Four kids. Four kids. Five it's kids. A, it's a giant herd. We're gonna try and make the airplanes match, so we got a lot to do. <laughs> Let's get to work. <laughs> hey, buddy. Hey, what are you doing? Sanding a run. <laughs> Sanding a run. That's my problem when I paint. I make runs. I'm really good at runs. So this is my son Dex's project. Here's my beautiful wife. <laughs> she can hold the phone. <laughs> so Dex. Here is my youngest son. He's already, I think, taller than me now, which doesn't take much. And uh, Dex has been working on four wave runners. He bought four pretty much non-functioning runners. You couldn't take them out because you might get them started, but they wouldn't get on step. So he's been gutting them, and now he's doing his first bodywork paint job. So he did all the bodywork. He's doing all the paint, running the gun, 100% is Dex. And uh, two of them he fixed up real quick by gutting parts from the others. 
and he's been out hot rodding them around with my kids. So that's been pretty awesome. I'm super proud of this guy. I love this guy. So we're gonna let Dex get back to work, right? Yeah, let's get back to work. <laughs> All right, it's about time. I'm finally doing the last final cut, trim, and sand of the window because it's going on next to stay, so. Closer, we didn't get wind against it. Time to install. All right, so I've made a trim. <laughs> it looks like crap right now, but it won't. So this trim is what trims out between the window frame and the front of the fuselage here. Um, anyway, they're only gonna be about two inches wide. And I think I'm gonna do it in carbon clear like this down here. So um, I've made it in two parts, splitting here. And that's so that, let me try to pull it off of here. There we go. Okay. Well, that's kind of a crazy looking part, but if you look, I made a C-channel right here. And the purpose of the C-channel on the end was to wrap around this door frame. And then there's two windows here, my side window and the front window. Normally a cut, this line is back here, but I wanted more aerodynamic, so I raked the window further forward and added another side window right here. And what I'm going to do now, I've got the step transition. I'll trim it all out. This will have the side window with a carbon clear trim around it. Um, but I've made it so that the screws that attach this go up this steel beam. And then I don't need screws at the back side here. And that allows me to make a really nice window trim without having screws or bolts sticking out where the window closes against the frame. Um, that makes it harder to seal or you have a pad, but it's still bump around every one of those bolts. So that's why the C-channel, the way it hooks on is it will slide on, snap into place, go around the front, and pull all the way along the front and up the center bar. So, uh, and then not, no screws on this back side so I have a cleaner joint and an airtight seal on my window. So this looks like a train wreck right now, but it won't very soon. I'm gonna pull the other side off, get marking out of tape, trim, cut, sand, back to it. I've already pulled this off, cleaned it up a little, put it back on. Now I'm just marking all the areas of where I need to cut and round edges. So all of this will be the trim, all the way around is one giant part, so I'm ready to pull it off and cut it. Sand it, clear coat it, install it, permanent. I'm gonna get it done today. <laughs> I'm super happy with how this turned out. I think it's looking really cool. I'll have a matching black trim that chases all the way around the door and the door window. Um, right now, it looks really rough. Um, it's because right now the coat that I've got on this trim piece is just a rubbed in clear coat to fill all the little pinholes that's in carbon fiber. A lot of people ask how I get a mirror carbon look on a part that is hand laid up like this. So typically you have a mold, you can spell it clear coat first, lay carbon into it, bag into it, and you pull it off. The parts already got a clear, perfect finish. That's the easy way, but if you don't have the money or it's not, doesn't make sense or time. And for me, it doesn't make sense to make a big mold to make one part or two parts or three parts. Typically, if I were to try and make a mold big enough to do this and that all out of a CNC, sand it, prep it, polish it, then be able to make a part off it. I could have five, $10,000 into a mold real easily in time and material. And I have few hours, well, a lot of hours. <laughs> but not a lot of cost, very, very little cost into this. And it's a one-off part, but I wanted to have a high gloss mirror finish. And since I don't have a mold, it goes into a lot more manual labor. So I sanded it, got it really smooth, as smooth as I can get it. 
then there's still gonna be little pinholes all over because carbon fiber is a weed, and I wanna fill that. So this looks like a big mess, and it is. This is just me taking clear coat, dipping it, and scrubbing it in to the part. So it's all bubbly and runny and everything else, but if you just scrub it in, let it sit overnight, come back, wet sand, polish it all out, then that can fill the little pinholes and then get the gun and spray a nice clear over top of it. Sometimes you get lucky first pass, usually not. <laughs> and you'll end up kind of daubing a couple little teeny pinholes the second round, sanding them out, then clearing it. So that's how I do it. Step one, make a part, sand it. Step two, baste it, rub it all in with a clear coat. Step three, sand, paint again. So then we'll install it. I didn't want to do anything more than that when I knew I was drilling, trimming, sanding, fine tuning, uh, all of it. Now that I've got it done, I'll go through, drill out the bigger holes, put in some nut plates, and now I can take it, wet sand it down really fine, then go back up to about a 300 grit to get some decent texture to it. Then I'll spray it with clear one last time, then I can take that, cut and buff it up, wet sand it, high polish it, and install it permanent. But I'm done with all the drilling, so I'm gonna pull it off, sand it, get back to work, get it on permanent. Finishing touches. <laughs> they always take longer than I thought, but I, have, I took my trim piece all the way off. Well, I put it on, masked it all off, which is the slow part, inside, outside. Then I put an eighth inch round bead of silicone on both sides, all the way around, pushed it on, wiped the silicone out, and the reason I do that, it's probably obvious, but so many planes, when I go to wash them and clean them up, these trim pieces, normally they're not all one part like this and they have lots of seams and joints, but they're also not sealed good from one to another. And when you wash them, water and mud goes down underneath the trim. And then later you come back and little muddy runs come out from underneath the other side an hour later. So, this took a couple hours to do this one part. I gotta do the other side, but I'm just putting an eighth inch bead all the way around. And now I can pull it off and it's siliconed where you can't see it all the way around. So I'll finish pulling all these off and uh, we'll be done soon. Now I can take this, ta-da. Install this, put on this last trim on this side. Let's get to work. Just in case someone can ask how I get the carbon fiber parts to all snap lock, if you've noticed. They usually go on, take a little pressure, a little tap, and then they click, and then they don't pop off. It's really simple. I try and find any kind of a negative return a bar is simple, even on this, it goes and returns under. And I make sure I get a few degrees around the back side of the, those returns anytime I make a part. And then I trim it up to the point that it's removable, but also so that it still has to flex and then snap around itself. So it really is a snap lock part. And I've tried to do it throughout the plane everywhere possible and so far so good. Not every one of them work out snap lock because it just won't work, but um, most of them, there's a way to do it. So I'm gonna get back at it. Okay, not sure if you remember way back when I made this part, but it's been a couple months and uh, it's officially going on for the last time. The window trim's on, I'm gonna put this on, one back here at the other side. So I'm um, a little nervous because I don't wanna scratch anything. There's a little trick to getting it on. But everything has to be pinched because it's actually clamshelling inside panel and outside panels all together. Ta-da! <laughs> oh man, that feels good to get that on. All right, guys, I just got home. It's real late. And... Uh, the garage is a little bit torn up, but 
you can't be more proud of a son than to come home to a big mess in a garage because he's rebuilding an engine from scratch uh, on a wave runner and he just finished getting one of them painted and he's starting to as assemble it. So I'm gonna show you what he's done, hold on. So I just barely got everything taped up so we don't worry about anything falling into the engine while we're dropping it into the wave runner. Got all the paint protected. So that's what's going on. Dex, how many times have you run a paint gun before doing this wave runner? Um, barely once, if you could say that. <laughs> so Dex learned all body work and uh, this is his paint job on his very old, very beat up wave runner that he's rebuilding from scratch. All new plastics, new moldings, stripped out the inside and did a complete engine overhaul all the way down to the crank and back up. I couldn't be more proud of my son. Good job, buddy. Let's throw this engine in your wave runner. <laughs> Back to work. <laughs> I'm working on my cow flap slash flap slash Bombay door drop. I don't know if you remember or saw an earlier video. I talked about putting little toy dudes with parachutes and then being able to drop them out of the belly of my plane. So this is that Bombay door drop. I made this up real quick and painted it yesterday. It went really fast. So it looks heavy. It's, it's actually really featherweight. This is a honeycomb core, so you can see the step here. And then I brought it back together on the end. These sides are a single ply, only one ply on honeycomb on the edges. And then I beaded a micro fill on a quarter inch deep. So you wouldn't see honeycomb. I gave it a nice finished edge. This through here is a honeycomb core bridge. And then this part right here is actually an embedded aluminum to aluminum angle iron, angle 90s. One goes this way, one goes this way. They're riveted together as a permanent seam and then attached all the way through to this side of this carbon fiber. So this gives me my strength to hook my linear actuator and operate my little Bombay door drop. I got this linear actuator. I just finished making up this bracket. I'm kind of pumped because this is gonna be a fast project. Started it yesterday, I'm gonna finish it today. And this will bolt on the underside of the plane. This side will come down. I gotta make a bracket for this side. And then as this expands and contracts, it'll open and close the door. It came with a little wire harness system with some relays. I kind of went through the diagram. I don't like the way this is set up. I'm going to tie in a potentiometer that position senses where this linear actuator is so that they work in sequence on a turn dial. So it's not that hard. It's just going to take a few more minutes, but I'll tie it all in together. And that way my turn dial on my panel, I can set it for cow flap and adjust it a little bit or all the way to a flat to add more lift or Bombay door drop. So I can play with any kind of position. And as soon as I turn it to that, it will automatically go and stop there. So I don't need to sit and hold the button for two and a half seconds till it gets to position. I can just turn it, let go, and it will finish all on its own. So it's a little more complicated. It's really no more weight. Um, the potentiometer is like, that big little drive on it, and I'll tie it in, so it's gonna be easy. That's my project today. Let's make my Bombay door go up and down. <laughs> Let's get to work. All right, guys, I'm down to the final couple brackets to stick my cow flap Bombay door on the bottom of Scrappy. So I got some carbon plates I made for in here for spacers. I need a quarter inch spacers. I need one of stack washers. Carbon fibers seem good, so that's what these are. Now I'm just drilling out the last of the two brackets, and we'll get it mounted up. Uh, with my two-day project, I had work, so it was just two partial days. Yesterday, we made, cut out, built my flap, cow flap, slash flap, slash Bombay door drop. And we designed it, made it, painted it, got it ready, and installed it today. 
And uh, I'm gonna try it right now. It's running off a linear actuator. And uh, silly things like this make me really happy. So if you check out, this automatically goes to the exact angle that matches the interior slope. So as the air comes through here from inside the engine bay, I've got this extra large cowling with this big airflow area. It goes in and it runs parallel out this and my cow flap is angled to maximize the most suction I can pull out of the bottom of the plane to literally pull the air through the engine. And then of course I've got it sized appropriately to the intake because you want them to be paired up correctly. So that's done. If I bottom out my suspension, won't I rip my cow flap off? <laughs> no. <laughs> I also won't hurt, hit my prop. So at full down, I still have on the flap, which is the lowest point, I still have several inches about like that. And, th and that is bottomed out. And to bottom out this plane, 20 inches of travel, man, I'd have to do more than screw up <laughs> to get that far down. The prop still will have almost 15 inches of prop clearance and we'll measure it depending on the angle that I have the suspension set at. But at full down, it will be near 15 inches of prop clearance still. So we'll be good to go. But I think I'm gonna sit around and make up some wire controllers and do this for at least another 10 hours straight because it makes me smile. 24 hours later. So the other thing I've done is when the cow flap is fully closed, it's smooth, it's fast, but it actually never closes completely because I always want a little air movement going through there. So it closes flat, but the ramp that's inside the plane carries just past it and leaves an opening for any high pressure to sneak out and still do cooling of the engine. Now the engine still has a side cooling, but I wanted more than the original. So even with the flap tight shut for the least amount of aerodynamic drag, there's still cooling air that can sneak out of it, but then I can carry it to whatever level I need. So you can't really tell, but from underneath or looking back at it, you'll see an opening all the way down it with the air clean. Hey guys, all right, so I hope you liked that video. I do have more content. We just need to put it together and we'll get it right out. So I had a few questions, I don't wanna go over them, and a lot around the rocket launch test. And uh, <laughs> thank you all of you who comment and make suggestions. I actually try and read through as much as I can. I wish I could uh, comment on all of them. I just simply can't get to them, which just makes me smile. So some of the questions I had were around some of the concerns and I thought I'd address them. One of them actually had a suggestion and said that they had fear that the person in the back seat would get such a shock load impact that it might literally break their back, blow out their ears, and have severe problems because of the shock of the rocket launch. So, any of you who may have thought that, let me put you at ease. The, the shock when that rocket goes off, it looks like it's actually blowing me forward from the concussion or the blast of that rocket blowing off the top of the aircraft. It's actually not. It's much sillier than that. It's me flinching <laughs> like a scared little girl. Yeah, yeah, I mean, we, yeah. Oh, Jesus Christ! When I pulled that, I literally, as soon as that sound goes off, I just tensed up and moved forward. The actual shock blast of the rocket does not go outward into the airplane. There was a second comment or several comments about uh, if the doors weren't open on that test, wouldn't they blow the windows out of the aircraft? It's actually a great thought. It was one I initially had until I saw the way the rocket was designed. So let me address both of those. The rocket itself is contained in a blast tube that is closed off so that as the rocket goes off, the rocket has to go up and the blast zone is contained. That's where it gets its initial shock load that propels the rocket at such a high force that it, that's where it breaks things, explodes the top of the aircraft off, but the blast is not released into the cabin of the airframe. It looks like it, and you do see smoke, and I'll explain that. 
What actually happens is that blast tube directs the blast straight at the rocket and the rocket before the propellant part of the explosion um, can get into the airframe has pushed the top of the aircraft off and opened up an escape zone for that pressure blast. And as the rocket goes out, the blast is jettisoned upward and outward with the rocket. The smoke you see going into the airplane is not that initial concussion blast that breaks the top of the plane off. That is contained and jettisoned out of the plane with the rocket. What you see immediately when I pull it is the secondary just burn blast that goes into the cabin that put the blast or the smoke in the cabin. The actual concussion, feeling it, my personal feeling it, is it's like sitting at a big fireworks show in a grandstand and the fireworks going off up there. You feel the concussion, but it's so mild. It's surprisingly mild. And also, there's concerns about wouldn't you blow your eardrums out, never be able to hear again. Justifiable concern. Surprisingly, even with just a helmet on, no ear protection, it wasn't loud. It's, it's, a, it's a more whisk pop, um, like a firework. You light off in your own street with no ear protection with five-year-old kids all around you. It's, it's really benign and it is not gonna injure you. But fortunately, you do have some hearing, hearing protection. You have headphones on because it's an aircraft. So you do have hearing protection. There is not a blast that could blow the back off a person in the back seat. Um, it's actually extremely safe to be right adjacent to it. But to add additional protection, the rocket is placed behind the parachute box, which gives it two giant wall carbon fiber barriers before it gets to the back seat. And then the back seat, when it goes in, has a third barrier. So there's three barriers. Quite frankly, we wouldn't need any of them. The other question I had, which is really cool, um, was a lot of thoughts about the burn, the fire, could it light anything on fire? Absolutely amazing. The blast is so fast, it can't do it. I commented on the video, um, but there isn't a burn risk whatsoever. So this rocket has been set off a bunch of times. Um, there is no burn. There has not been a fire started from a rocket. Um, the blast is just too quick, too fast, and out of the aircraft. The other question I had, which actually makes a lot of sense, um, was why wouldn't you do a test putting up a bunch of fans, a rocket, or air blast so that you could simulate the rocket coming out of the aircraft with relative wind as if you were in a 100 mile an hour forward flight like you would be in a Cub that would simulate and make sure that the parachute would come out of the bag and still deploy because a ground test, maybe that wouldn't be an appropriate test without a wind blast. So let me address that. After hundreds and hundreds of deployments and ground tests, here's what's been found. If you can pass a ground launch test, you're more likely for success in the air, and this will make sense. There's no reason to do a blast test on the ground and try and somehow create 100 mile an hour winds, which would be literally <laughs> parking a, a giant jumbo jet and shooting it at your aircraft while you launch the rocket, because fans wouldn't do it. But it's a logical thought, but here's what actually happens. The rocket propels out of the aircraft, and if the airplane was moving forward and the wind is pulling it back, it actually accelerates and increases the pull on the bag that rips it out of its box and pulls the chute out of the bag that's been drug up into the air. If you think about it, on the ground, the rocket has to do 100% of the work and drag the parachute out. In flight, the rocket just has to get the bag out of the plane. And then the wind does the rest of the work. That 100 mile an hour wind grabs that bag that's been shot out of the plane, pulls it backwards, and literally forces an extension of the straps. So the, the more wind you have, the faster that bag will interact with that wind from forward flight, drag it the rocket pulling it up, the bag pulling it back, and it deploys back here. So if you just get the bag out of the plane, you're in good shape, the wind's gonna do the rest. So thank you for those of you who commented, I hope that makes sense, but a successful ground test with a rocket launch means 
a much higher probability of a successful full bag deployment in air with the assistance of the wind. I'm sure you guys have a lot more questions about all kinds of crazy things we're building. Thank you for following along, sticking out here to the end. I'll try and do more answers at the end. Um, if you have questions you wanna know, put them in the comments. If I see enough of them that are similar, I'm gonna try and address those as my top priority, trying to get to all I can. Thank you again for following my crazy build, Scrappy. More to come. As always, let's get back to work.